Greetings, history enthusiasts. Join us as we unlock the secrets of bygone eras. The Panama Canal, one of the world's most significant and complex engineering projects, has a history marked by ambition, perseverance, and tragedy. The 50-mile waterway, which connects the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, required overcoming not only the challenge of formidable terrain, but also the obstacles posed by disease, political turmoil, and technological limitations. Early Plans and Exploration The concept of the Panama Canal traces its roots to the early days of exploration, when Europe began discovering and laying claim to the New World. In 1513, Vasco Nuvez de Balboa, a Spanish conquistador, undertook a daring expedition across the Isthmus of Panama. This expedition led to the Western world's first knowledge of the Pacific Ocean, which Balboa christened the South Sea. The importance of Balboa's discovery was immediately apparent. The potential for a maritime shortcut from Europe to Asia, by passing the dangerous and lengthy route around South America's Cape Horn, was tantalizing. However, in the context of 16th century technology and geopolitics, such an ambitious project was far beyond reach. Over the next two centuries, as European powers solidified their holdings in the Americas, the idea of a canal through Panama persisted. Explorers and adventurers periodically attempted overland expeditions across the isthmus, often with disastrous results due to the rugged terrain and hostile indigenous populations. Still, each failed attempt only reinforced the need for a direct passage. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, with the advancement of scientific and engineering knowledge, the concept of a canal was revived with more seriousness. Alexander von Humboldt, the Prussian polymath and geographer, was among those who passionately advocated for the construction of a canal. His travels through the Americas in the early 19th century further fueled European interest in the project. Meanwhile, in the United States, President Thomas Jefferson, fascinated by the possibilities of westward expansion and Pacific trade, instructed his Secretary of Treasury, Albert Gallatin, to investigate the feasibility of a canal in the early 1800s. However, the ongoing Napoleonic Wars in Europe and internal challenges in the newly independent Latin American nations limited any concrete progress during this period. Despite these challenges, the aspiration to build a canal remained a powerful notion. During the California Gold Rush of 1848, tens of thousands of prospectors flooded from the eastern United States to the West Coast underscoring the need for faster, safer transit across the American continent. Many of these gold seekers chose the arduous journey across the Isthmus of Panama rather than the dangerous trip around Cape Horn or the long overland route across the United States. This influx of travelers led to the development of the Panama Railroad, completed in 1855, which provided a rapid transit route across the Isthmus. Although the railroad significantly eased travel, it also highlighted the limitations of overland transport and further fueled the desire for a maritime passage. By the latter half of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution had introduced new technologies such as steam-powered machinery and modern serving techniques. These developments, coupled with growing geopolitical and commercial interests, brought the vision of a canal into the realm of possibility. The construction of the Suez Canal by the French in 1869 added momentum to this idea, bringing us to the next significant chapter in the history of the Panama Canal, the French attempt. The French attempt, 1881 to 1894. The era of French involvement in the Panama Canal, spanning from 1881 to 1894, was a chapter marked by high hopes, heroic endeavors, and tragic failures. The figure at the center of this saga was Ferdinand de Lesseps, a charismatic French diplomat turned entrepreneur who had successfully overseen the construction of the Suez Canal in Egypt. With this remarkable achievement, de Lesseps became a national hero in France, and his reputation gave impetus to the dream of a canal through the Isthmus of Panama. In 1879, de Lesseps formed the Compagnie Universelle du Canal Interoceanique, leveraging his fame to attract both public and private investment. 
the French public, buoyed by national pride, and the success of the Suez Canal, eagerly bought shares in the company, raising significant capital for the venture. De Lesseps and his team launched the project in 1881 with considerable fanfare and optimism, despite warnings from engineers about the challenges they would face. One of the most critical strategic decisions made by De Lesseps and his team was to construct a sea-level canal, similar to the Suez Canal. This choice was based on their underestimation of the challenging Panamanian terrain and climate. Unlike the relatively flat and dry desert of Suez, Panama was a maze of mountains, swamps, and dense jungles. Moreover, the region was plagued by heavy rainfall, causing frequent landslides and making the excavation work extremely treacherous. As the work commenced, the French soon encountered a series of seemingly insurmountable problems. The dense jungle was far more difficult to clear than anticipated, and the rainy season turned the excavation sites into quagmires. The high-grade tools and machinery brought from France rusted quickly in the tropical climate, and replacements were slow to arrive due to the logistics of the time. The most devastating challenge, however, was the rampant spread of tropical diseases such as malaria and yellow fever. Medical science at the time did not yet understand that these diseases were transmitted by mosquitoes. As a result, the labor force, comprising mostly local workers and laborers imported from the Caribbean, was decimated. An estimated 22,000 workers lost their lives during the French construction period. A tragic human cost that cast a dark shadow over the project. In addition to these operational issues, the project was beset by financial and organizational problems. Costs spiraled out of control, far exceeding the original estimates. Allegations of financial mismanagement and corruption began to surface, eroding investor confidence. By 1889, the weight of these issues brought the project to its knees. The company declared bankruptcy, leaving the canal unfinished and investors penniless. Over $287 million had been spent, an astronomical sum for the time, with little to show for it. Despite this failure, the French did not entirely abandon their canal dreams. A new company, the Compagnie Nouvelle du Canal de Panama, was formed in 1894 to take over the assets of the bankrupt company and continue the work. However, this new venture struggled to attract adequate funding and made little progress in advancing the project. The French attempt at building the Panama Canal serves as a poignant reminder of the complexity and unpredictability of large-scale engineering projects. Despite their initial optimism and considerable resources, the French were unable to overcome the formidable natural, technical, and human challenges they encountered. Yet their effort laid the groundwork for the future construction of the canal by the United States, marking a critical chapter in the canal's storied history. Hay Ponce Fote Treaty, 1901. The Hay Ponce Fote Treaty of 1901 was a landmark diplomatic agreement that laid the groundwork for the United States' construction of the Panama Canal. The treaty not only represented a significant step towards the realization of a long-held American ambition, but also symbolized a shift in global power dynamics at the dawn of the 20th century. The desire for a canal across the Central American Isthmus had been a long-standing objective for the United States. Throughout the 19th century, the U.S. had increasingly recognized the strategic and economic potential of such a route. It would not only provide a faster pathway for commercial shipping between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, but also allow swift deployment of naval assets in times of conflict. However, the question of the canal was not solely an American concern. It was also intricately tied to international geopolitics. An earlier agreement, the Clayton-Bulwer Treaty of 1850 between the U.S. and Great Britain, had already established a shared understanding that any potential canal in Central America would be under joint control and neutral in all conflicts. This agreement had maintained a delicate balance of power, but by the end of the 19th century, the U.S., buoyed by its industrial and naval growth, began to seek a more dominant role. The hay ponce Vote Treaty was negotiated against this backdrop. Named after U.S. Secretary of State John Hay and British Ambassador Julian Ponsvote, 
The treaty was an effort to revisit and renegotiate the terms of the Clayton-Bulwer Treaty. The negotiations reflected the United States' rising global stature and Britain's willingness to accommodate this emerging power, primarily due to shifting strategic interests and the strains of maintaining its vast empire. Under the terms of the hay Pontsfoot Treaty, Britain rescinded its claim to joint control over any prospective canal, effectively giving the U.S. the exclusive right to construct, administer, and defend such a waterway. The treaty maintained the provision that the canal would remain open to all nations in times of war and peace, but the U.S. alone would guarantee this neutrality. The U.S. Senate ratified the hay Pontsfoot Treaty in 1901, but not without significant amendments. The Senate eliminated the Lock-Free Canal Clause, which had aimed to prevent the U.S. from fortifying the canal, a clear indication of the country's intentions to exercise military as well as commercial control over the canal. The treaty marked the final diplomatic hurdle to the U.S. pursuit of a canal and signaled Britain's tacit acknowledgement of the U.S. as a global power. Yet it was not without controversy. Critics argued that it signified British capitulation to U.S. hegemony in the Americas, contravening the spirit of the Monroe Doctrine, while others viewed it as a pragmatic adjustment to the changing realities of global power. Ultimately, the hay Pontsfoot Treaty was a critical precursor to the U.S.'s successful construction of the Panama Canal. It represented not only a tangible step toward realizing a transoceanic canal, but also a symbolic milestone in the United States' ascent to global prominence. U.S. Acquisition of the Canal Zone, 1904 The acquisition of the Panama Canal Zone by the United States in 1904 represented a pivotal moment in the history of the canal and a significant milestone in U.S. foreign policy. The journey to this acquisition involved a complex mix of diplomacy, intervention, and commerce, all underpinned by the strategic ambition of the United States to establish an interoceanic waterway. The story begins in the wake of the failed French attempt to build the canal. As the French project floundered and the United States gained the right to construct a canal via the hay Pontsfoot Treaty of 1901, attention turned to the acquisition of land for the canal. The Isthmus of Panama, at that time, was a part of Colombia. The U.S. government initiated negotiations with Colombia, resulting in the hay heron Treaty of 1903. This treaty would have allowed the U.S. to lease a strip of land across the Isthmus for canal construction. However, in a surprising turn of events, the Colombian Senate rejected the treaty, primarily due to nationalist opposition and a desire for better terms. The rejection of the hay heron Treaty was a setback for the United States Canal Plans, but it proved to be a catalyst for Panama's fight for independence. Panama, long discontented with Colombian rule, saw an opportunity in aligning with American interests. Panamanian nationalists, led by a group of influential businessmen and politicians, declared independence from Colombia on November 3, 1903. The U.S., under the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, was quick to support the nascent rebellion. The U.S. national was dispatched to the region, effectively blocking Colombian troops from suppressing the uprising a clear demonstration of Roosevelt's big-stick diplomacy. The new Republic of Panama was quickly recognized by the U.S., and in return, the Panamanian government, represented by French engineer Philip John Bono Varilla, signed the hay Bono Varilla Treaty. Under the terms of this treaty, Panama granted the United States the rights to a strip of land 10 miles wide and 50 miles long, in perpetuity. This area, known as the Panama Canal Zone, would be under U.S. sovereignty and control. This was not without controversy. Many Panamanians, including those who had been involved in the fight for independence, were outraged by Bono Varilla's concessions. He had acted without consulting the new Panamanian government, and the agreement was seen by many as simply replacing Colombian control with American control. Nevertheless, with the treaty signed, the United States turned its attention to the practicalities of building the canal. The U.S. purchased the rights, equipment, and excavations of the failed French project for $40 million, 
an agreement that allowed them to build upon the French efforts and significantly reduce the initial groundwork required. On May 4, 1904, the United States officially took control of the Canal Zone, marking the beginning of a new chapter in the history of the Panama Canal. This acquisition was a testament to America's growing international influence, its assertive foreign policy, and its unwavering determination to realize the dream of an interoceanic canal. Construction under the United States, 1904 to 1914. The construction of the Panama Canal under the United States from 1904 to 1914 represents a decade-long testament to American engineering prowess, tenacity, and managerial acumen. The project was characterized by a series of monumental challenges, innovative engineering solutions, and significant human efforts under the guidance of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Two figures loom large in this period, John F. Stevens, and Colonel George Washington Gothels. John F. Stevens, a seasoned railroad engineer, was appointed as chief engineer and chairman of the Eisthmian Canal Commission in 1905. Stevens was a man of action and innovation, and under his direction, the project took a significant turn. Rather than continuing to pursue the flawed sea-level canal concept that the French had tried, Stevens proposed a radically different plan, a lock-based canal. The lock-based design involved creating a series of water compartments, locks, that would raise or lower ships to different water levels, allowing them to traverse the varied elevations of the Panamanian landscape. This approach was ultimately more compatible with the region's topography and reduced the need for extensive excavation. Stevens' innovative thinking marked a decisive break from the past and put the project on a more feasible path. However, Stevens also recognized that the canal's construction was not merely an engineering challenge, it was also a massive logistical and human endeavor. One of the most significant issues was the health and well-being of the workers. The failure of the French attempt was still fresh in memory, and its human cost, a result of rampant disease and poor living conditions, was a stark warning. Stevens initiated significant improvements in the workers' conditions, he established better housing and recreational facilities, improving the workers' morale. Understanding the role of mosquitoes in transmitting diseases like yellow fever and malaria. Thanks to the pioneering work of Dr. William Gorgas, Stevens implemented comprehensive sanitation systems and mosquito control measures. These steps led to a drastic reduction in disease-related deaths among the workers, ensuring a stable and healthy workforce. In 1907, Stevens resigned due to policy disagreements with the U.S. administration, and his role was taken over by U.S. Army Colonel George Washington Gothels. Gothels, a West Point graduate with a strong background in civil engineering, brought military discipline and organization to the project. Gothels faced many daunting challenges, the sheer scale of the project, labor disputes, unpredictable weather, landslides, and persistent disease outbreaks all threatened to derail progress. However, Gothels met these challenges head-on. He maintained a strong rapport with the workers, even holding weekly meetings to address grievances personally, which helped to alleviate labor tensions. Under Gothels' leadership, the project moved ahead at an impressive pace. He oversaw the successful completion of the Culebra Cut, an enormous excavation through the Continental Divide, and the construction of the Gatton Dam, at the time the largest earthen dam in the world. He also supervised the final stages of the lock construction, an unprecedented feat of engineering. In August 1914, the Panama Canal was officially completed, a testament to Gothel's capable management and the tenacity of the workers who had toiled in its construction. The completion of the canal marked a transformative moment in global trade and transportation and in the ascendance of the United States as a world power. This engineering marvel was a product of human ingenuity, perseverance, and the leadership of men like Stevens and Gothels, who navigated the project through a decade of extraordinary challenges. Canal Design and Construction The Panama Canal an engineering marvel of the early 20th century is the embodiment of human ingenuity, perseverance, 
and the ambition to overcome geographical constraints. The final design and construction of the canal was a complex undertaking that required innovative engineering solutions, the mobilization of a massive workforce, and the ability to grapple with the unique challenges of the Panamanian terrain. The design of the Panama Canal as a lock canal was a significant departure from the original sea-level concept pursued by the French and initially considered by the Americans. The decision to construct a lock canal was driven by the unique geographical challenges of Panama, particularly the substantial height difference between the Pacific and Atlantic ends due to the Central American mountain range or the Continental Divide. A sea-level canal would have required an impractical amount of excavation and presented insurmountable engineering challenges. The concept of a lock canal, championed by John F. Stevens, offered a more feasible solution. The canal is a system of artificial lakes and channels connected by a series of locks. These locks serve to raise and lower ships as they navigate through the canal, bypassing the difficult terrain. The locks are essentially large water-filled chambers whose water level can be altered by adding or draining water. This innovative approach allowed the construction team to essentially create a water staircase to guide ships across the varying altitudes of the isthmus. One of the most challenging aspects of the construction was the Culebra Cut, later renamed the Gaillard Cut, a nine-mile channel carved through the Continental Divide. This massive excavation project took six years of intense labor under hazardous conditions. Landslides were frequent, and the scale of the work was unprecedented. Nevertheless, the completion of the Culebra Cut was a significant achievement and marked a crucial step in the canal's construction. The lock system itself was an engineering marvel. The canal includes three sets of locks, the Gaetan locks on the Atlantic side, the Pedro Miguel and Miraflores locks on the Pacific side. Each lock chamber was a colossal structure, measuring 110 feet wide, 1,000 feet long, and 40 feet deep, large enough to accommodate the massive ocean-going vessels of the time. The locks operate by a system of culverts that allow water to flow in or out of the chambers. Each lock has two lanes, allowing for the simultaneous transit of vessels in opposite directions. Remarkably, the locks are gravity-fed from Gaten Lake, and no pumps are used to move water in or out of the chambers, a testament to the ingenious design of the canal. The canal's construction was more than an engineering feat. It was a complex logistical operation involving tens of thousands of workers, the importation of enormous quantities of materials and machinery, and the need to overcome numerous natural obstacles. The completion of the canal in 1914 represented a triumph of human endeavor and forever changed global trade and transportation by providing a shortcut between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Completion and Opening, 1914 The completion and opening of the Panama Canal in 1914 represents an epochal moment not only in the history of engineering, but also in the annals of global trade transportation, and geopolitics. After a decade of intense labor, innovative engineering, and expenditure of human and financial resources, the canal was ready to fulfill its promise as a gateway between the Atlantic and the Pacific. The canal was officially opened on August 15, 1914. The cargo ship SS Ankin, laden with a cargo of cement and a few passengers, had the honor of being the first vessel to traverse the canal. It sailed from the Atlantic end, maneuvered through the Gatton Locks, traversed the artificial Gatton Lake, cut through the mountain range via the Culebra Cut, and descended to the Pacific level through the Pedro Miguel and Miraflores Locks. The successful transit of the SS Ankin represented the culmination of the extraordinary effort that had gone into the canal's construction and the beginning of a new era in maritime travel and commerce. While the opening of the canal was a momentous event, it was notably understated due to the unfolding global situation. The outbreak of World War, I just days before the canal's opening, meant that what was intended to be a grand international celebration was scaled down to a simple local event. Despite this, the opening of the canal was widely recognized for its significant global implications. 
The Panama Canal's construction came with an enormous financial cost. The final cost of the project was around $375 million. This figure included the cost of construction, sanitation, labor, the purchase of the French company's assets, and the payment to Panama for the rights to the canal zone. Adjusted for inflation, this was one of the most expensive construction projects in history at that time. However, the strategic and economic benefits that the United States would derive from controlling the canal would soon prove this investment to be well worth it. The completion of the Panama Canal stands as a testament to human will and ingenuity. It transformed the global shipping industry by providing a faster and safer route between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, by passing the treacherous route around Cape Horn. It symbolized America's ascendance as a global power, highlighting its technological prowess and its ability to undertake and complete a project of such unprecedented scale and complexity. The Panama Canal remains one of the greatest engineering feats of the 20th century, a monument to the ambition, tenacity, and skill of those who conceived, designed, and built it. Post-Completion Era The completion of the Panama Canal in 1914 marked the beginning of a new era in the global maritime landscape. However, the narrative did not conclude with the cutting of the ribbon. The post-completion era of the Panama Canal, marked by geopolitical shifts, strategic considerations, and constant technological adaptations, is a story unto itself that spans more than a century. Under the terms of the hay bono varilla Treaty of 1903, the United States had acquired perpetual control over the canal and the surrounding canal zone. For the better part of the 20th century, the Panama Canal was managed and operated by the United States. This control was instrumental in defining American foreign policy in the region and served as a symbol of American technological and economic prowess. However, the United States' control over the canal was a matter of contention in Panama and beyond, stirring sentiments of nationalism and cries for sovereignty. This culminated in the 1977 Torrijos-Carter Treaties, named after U.S. President Jimmy Carter and the Panamanian leader Omar Torrijos. According to these treaties, the United States agreed to gradually transfer control of the canal to Panama. The transfer was to be complete by December 31, 1999, and it marked a significant turning point in the history of the canal and U.S.-Panama relations. The transfer of control was conducted smoothly, and by the stipulated date, Panama assumed full control over the canal. It was a momentous occasion for the Panamanian nation, symbolizing a reclaiming of its sovereignty and providing an opportunity to benefit directly from the canal's revenues. This transfer was not without its concerns, especially about whether Panama could effectively manage and maintain such a complex operation. However, these concerns were largely assuaged as the Panama Canal Authority proved adept in managing the canal, maintaining its operational efficiency and safety. In the post-transfer era, the Panama Canal continues to play a crucial role in global trade, serving as a major transit route for maritime traffic. As ships have grown larger in the era of containerization and globalization, the canal has had to evolve to accommodate these new dimensions. The most significant upgrade in this regard has been the Panama Canal Expansion Project, completed in 2016, which added a new lane of traffic and built larger, new locks, allowing the passage of larger Neo-Panamax ships. This expansion, the largest enhancement project since the canal's original construction, underscores the canal's continued importance in facilitating global trade. The canal remains a critical shipping route, connecting over 140 maritime routes and 1,700 ports in more than 160 countries. Moreover, the revenues from the canal are vital to Panama's economy, contributing significantly to its gross domestic product. In conclusion, the post-completion era of the Panama Canal presents a dynamic narrative of geopolitical negotiation, national sovereignty, technological evolution, and the canal's unwavering role as a vital artery of global trade. The canal stands as a testament to human ambition and ingenuity, a symbol of Panama's sovereignty and a cornerstone of global maritime commerce.
Its story continues to unfold as it adapts to the evolving demands of global shipping and trade. More information and facts. Labor and social impact. The monumental feat of the Panama Canal was not merely the work of ingenious engineers and administrators, but equally, if not more so, the fruit of the labor of tens of thousands of workers who toiled in challenging conditions. Understanding the labor and social impact of the canal's construction is an integral part of the canal's history and provides a crucial insight into the human cost of this unprecedented endeavor. The canal's construction attracted workers from around the globe, drawn by the promise of wages that surpassed those in their homelands. A significant number were West Indian immigrants, particularly from Jamaica and Barbados, but laborers came from as far as Spain, Italy, Greece and India. An estimated 75,000 laborers worked on the project under U.S. direction. Labor conditions were harsh, with long hours, heavy physical labor, and oppressive tropical heat. Workers lived in segregated labor camps, with housing and amenities differing significantly between white and non-white workers. These camps were often overcrowded, and sanitation was initially poor, contributing to the rapid spread of diseases. Disease was an ever-present threat and took a significant toll on the workforce. Yellow fever and malaria, transmitted by mosquitoes, were particularly deadly. Accidents were also a common occurrence, given the nature of the work and the lack of proper safety measures. It's estimated that more than 5,600 workers lost their lives during the American construction period alone. The mortality rate was significantly higher during the French construction phase due to less understanding of tropical diseases. The Canal Project saw different wage scales based on race and nationality, a policy that resulted in significant social tensions. White American workers, often in skilled positions, were paid in gold, while non-white workers, mostly in unskilled jobs, were paid in silver at significantly lower rates. This gold and silver wage policy institutionalized a form of racial segregation and was a constant source of discontent among the workforce. However, over time, efforts were made to improve workers' conditions. The appointment of Dr. William Gorgas as the chief sanitary officer resulted in aggressive measures to combat diseases, including large-scale mosquito eradication campaigns and improved sanitation facilities. This significantly reduced the incidence of disease and improved workers' health. Similarly, John Stevens, the chief engineer, recognized that workers' well-being was integral to the project's success. He worked to improve living conditions, introduced a shorter eight-hour workday, and implemented workers' compensation for injuries, innovative labor policies for that era. The legacy of the canal's construction is still evident in Panama today, with a significant Afro-Panamanian population descended from West Indian laborers. The project also had a significant impact on participating countries, such as Barbados, where the emigration of a significant portion of the male workforce to Panama had profound social and economic effects. Health Measures the completion of the Panama Canal was not solely an engineering and administrative triumph. It was equally a triumph of medical science. The tremendous health challenges that plagued the canal project, most significantly yellow fever and malaria, threatened its completion. This threat was not just to the laborers, but also to the project itself. It was against this backdrop that Dr. William C. Gorgas, a U.S. Army physician, implemented health measures that played a pivotal role in the canal's successful completion. When the U.S. acquired the rights to the canal, they also inherited the health crisis that had contributed significantly to the failure of the French effort. Gorgas was appointed as chief sanitary officer in 1904, a time when yellow fever and malaria outbreaks were causing significant loss of life and demoralizing the workforce. Gorgas was well prepared for the challenge. He had previously successfully eradicated yellow fever from Havana, Cuba, following the Spanish-American War using the then-groundbreaking discoveries of Dr. Carlos Finlay and Dr. Walter Reed. Finlay had hypothesized that yellow fever was transmitted by mosquitoes, a theory later confirmed by Reed. This understanding of the disease's transmission was revolutionary at the time 
and formed the basis of Gorgas's health measures in Panama. With a budget that at one point accounted for over one-fifth of the entire canal project, Gorgas implemented a comprehensive anti-mosquito campaign. Teams of workers drained swamps, cut back jungle vegetation, and spread oil on standing water to prevent mosquito breeding. Water supplies were covered, and mosquito netting was distributed to protect workers at night. Buildings were regularly fumigated, and the use of quinine, an anti-malarial drug, was enforced among the workforce. Gorgas's efforts also extended to broader public health measures. He improved sanitation by constructing modern sewer and water systems and built hospitals, including the Ancon Hospital, which became a leading center for tropical medicine. Gorgas also established a sanitary zone around the canal area, within which building codes and other health regulations were strictly enforced. The results of Gorgas's measures were transformative. Yellow fever was eliminated from the canal zone by 1905, and malaria cases were significantly reduced. The reduction in disease not only saved lives, but also boosted morale and productivity, contributing immensely to the project's progress and eventual completion. Despite the skepticism he initially faced, Gorgas's work was ultimately recognized for its significant impact. His public health measures, based on the understanding of disease transmission, were groundbreaking at the time and set a precedent for future public health initiatives. Geopolitical Impact The construction and control of the Panama Canal had profound geopolitical implications, shaping not only U.S. foreign policy and its relations with Latin America, but also global shipping, military strategy, and economic patterns. At the turn of the 20th century, the United States was transitioning from a regional power into a global one. The construction of the Panama Canal was symbolic of this transition. It underlined the U.S. growing industrial might and its ambition to extend its influence globally. U.S. involvement in the Panama Canal began with a controversial diplomatic maneuver. The U.S. supported Panama's secession from Colombia in 1903 to gain favorable terms for the canal's construction and control. The hay bunna varilla Treaty that followed granted the U.S. control over the canal zone in perpetuity, a deal that was highly unfavorable to Panama. This direct intervention marked a shift in U.S. policy towards a more assertive approach in its relations with Latin America, later codified in the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Control of the canal allowed the U.S. to effectively influence the region's politics and economics. However, this power was not without controversy. Resentment over perceived U.S. imperialism grew over the years, leading to several instances of political tension and conflict, most notably the Panama Canal Zone riots in 1964. Internationally, the canal's strategic importance was immediately recognized. It became a vital maritime shortcut, reducing the journey between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans by 8,000 miles. This shift drastically reduced shipping times and costs, which had a transformative effect on global trade patterns. Suddenly, commodities such as wheat from the U.S. Midwest or nitrate from Chile could reach European markets more quickly and inexpensively. The canal consequently played a role in the growth and globalization of the world economy in the 20th century. In military terms, the canal was of great strategic significance. It allowed the U.S. Navy to move its ships quickly between the two oceans, enhancing its flexibility and response times. This advantage was evident during both World Wars and the Cold War, where the canal played a critical role in the strategic planning and operations of the U.S. and its allies. The geopolitical impact of the Panama Canal can also be seen in its eventual handover to Panama in 1999. The Torrijos-Carter Treaties of 1977, which set the handover in motion, were part of a broader shift in U.S. foreign policy towards respect for national sovereignty. This handover marked the end of a significant chapter in U.S.-Latin American relations, though it did not entirely erase the historical tensions. Environmental Impact the construction and operation of the Panama Canal have had substantial environmental impacts, reshaping both the physical and biological landscape of the Isthmus of Panama. 
To understand these impacts, we must examine the alterations made to the region's hydrology, the loss and fragmentation of habitat due to construction, and the ongoing consequences for the local ecosystems. The creation of the canal required the damming of the Chagres River to form Gatton Lake, one of the largest artificial lakes in the world at the time. This feat of engineering transformed the area's hydrology. The flooding inundated a vast region of tropical rainforest, effectively submerging an estimated 262 square kilometers of land. This dramatic reshaping of the landscape resulted in habitat loss for many species and altered the regional biodiversity. Moreover, the construction of the canal, including the massive Culebra Cut, caused significant land modification and fragmentation of terrestrial habitats. The forest clearance, earth moving, and reshipping of the landscape disturbed local ecosystems, leading to the loss of flora and fauna and impacting biodiversity. The canal's ongoing operation continues to affect local ecosystems, particularly aquatic ones. Water used for the operation of the canal's locks is drawn from Gatton Lake and released into the sea, which can potentially affect the lake's water levels and disrupt the freshwater ecosystems. Furthermore, the movement of ships through the canal has led to the unintentional introduction of non-native species, a process known as bioinvasion. These non-native species, whether marine organisms carried in ballast water or terrestrial species transported on the ships, can outcompete local species for resources, leading to significant ecological disruption. Beyond the immediate area of the canal, the human presence associated with the canal's construction and operation has brought about broader environmental changes. Urban development in the canal zone and adjacent areas has led to deforestation and land use changes. These developments have had cascading effects on local ecosystems, affecting species composition and abundance. The environmental history of the Panama Canal provides a compelling illustration of the complex and profound ways in which such a massive infrastructure project can impact local ecosystems. While the canal has undoubtedly provided substantial economic and logistical benefits globally, these have come at considerable environmental costs. Recognizing and understanding these impacts is vital, both for historical completeness and for informing future projects to balance human needs with environmental stewardship. Current Challenges and Future Prospects The Panama Canal, over a century after its initial construction, continues to face evolving challenges. These include the environmental strain posed by climate change, the emergence of new competitive sea routes due to shifts in global climate and geopolitical and economic pressures. These challenges also create opportunities for further expansion and modernization, shaping the future of this vital global artery. One of the most significant issues is climate change, which has manifested in two principal ways. First, changes in rainfall patterns and water availability have direct consequences on the canal's operation given the essential role of freshwater in the canal's lock system. Prolonged drought conditions, such as those experienced during El Nino events, reduce water levels in Gatton and Alajuela lakes, limiting the canal's cargo-carrying capacity and potentially disrupting global shipping. Secondly, rising sea levels pose a long-term threat to the canal's infrastructure. Higher sea levels can increase the risk of flooding and saltwater intrusion, which could damage the canal's locks and other infrastructure and disrupt freshwater ecosystems. Competition from alternative sea routes is another ongoing challenge. The gradual melting of Arctic sea ice due to global warming has opened up the northern sea route, which could serve as a faster passage between Europe and Asia during the summer months. Moreover, the Suez Canal, following its expansion in 2015, has emerged as a competitive alternative for vessels too large for the Panama Canal, even after its 2016 expansion. Economic and geopolitical factors also play a critical role. Shifts in global trade patterns, changes in the energy market, particularly with the U.S. shale gas boom, and fluctuations in the global economy can impact the volume of traffic through the canal, affecting its revenue. Looking forward, the Panama Canal Authority ACP 
is considering various strategies to ensure the canal's continued relevance and sustainability. These include further expansion and modernization to accommodate larger vessels, improvements in water management to cope with climate change, and diversification of revenue sources, such as developing logistics parks and offering value-added services. Balancing these developments with environmental conservation is a crucial part of this future strategy. At the same time, the canal's future is not solely in the hands of the ACP. Global cooperation to mitigate climate change, strategic navigation policy, and global economic stability are all critical for the canal's future. It's a testament to the canal's enduring importance that its future is inseparable from broader global trends and challenges.